All right, welcome everyone. In just a minute, we'll get started here. Let's just give it a minute for everyone to be able to join. All right, I think we should be good. Welcome everyone to this FluxNet Early Career Seminar. Uh, your host today is uh, Andres Santos. And we have a couple of really great talks for you today. So take it away, Andre. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are here today for uh, one more FluxNet ECM seminar, a community event co-sponsored by FluxNet Early Career Network, a Flux management project, and members of the FluxNet communities. Uh, today, we will hear from Nelson Luis Diaz from the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil and Livia Souza Freire from the University of São Paulo, Brazil on theoretical field measurements and numerical simulation for atmospheric turbulent transport and surface fluxes. So I will first introduce Professor Nelson and then at the Livia presentation, I'll, I'll introduce her. So Professor Nelson Luis Diaz is a professor at the Environmental Engineering of the Federal University of Paraná, Brazil. He holds a bachelor and a master's in civil engineering from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and a PhD from Cornell University. His research interests include boundary lay meteorology, hydrology, and numerical and analytical methods in fluid mechanics. He has done research in scalar similarity, dissimilarity in the atmosphere and surrogate systems such as Bernard Halley, convection, lake evaporation, and watershed evapotranspiration, analytical solutions for the Bucinesque groundwater equation, greenhouse emission from lakes, radiation interaction with turbulence in long wave radiation models, unnamed atmospheric vehicles for propping the atmospheric boundary layer, and turbulence in the Huguenot layer, among others. I think now it's with you, Professor Nelson. Okay, Andrea, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you are on, on the planet. Um, I will start sharing my, my screen now. So, and the simple way for me to do this is just to share the whole screen. So you should be seeing, um, my slides now. Andre, can you see it? Yes, perfectly. Oh, okay, so uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, how the governing equations of fluid mechanics can help to guide uh, research in the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, here's my email if you want to get in touch uh, and my uh, personal uh, web page. Yeah, and again, thank you very much uh, for the conveners to, to invite me. It's an uh, it's, uh, honor to be here. Uh, and uh, here's uh, what this, the stuff shouldn't be too long. Uh, this is, is, these are the contents. So I'll be giving a, a brief introduction. And then I'll talk about my favorite subject, which is turbulence. And I'll cover things that many of you, most of you, or all of you uh, already know, just to, to give some sequence to, to the talk. And then I'll give you a few examples of, um, of how, in my personal experience, I've seen the governing equations leading to some uh, um, interesting results. And then I'll conclude briefly. Um, so, uh, Surface fluxes and atmospheric measurements, in, in uh, turbulence measurements in general, are important to, to many, many fields. They're important to meteorology, to hydrology, to ecology, to agronomy, to environmental engineering, and probably a lot of other fields that I have, uh, um, that I'm not mentioning here. In, uh, so this is, this is a very uh, a interesting field because you have, people with so many different backgrounds coming together and discussing things. It is also very challenging because of that, because we have to, to be able to see each other's points of view. Uh, this afternoon, it's the afternoon here in, in Curitiba, I'll be giving you just 
a glimpse of my point of view, but they are not by no means uh, the, the whole picture, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so if you measure turbulence in the atmospheric boundary layer and you, and you do it right, you can actually contribute to, to, to many uh, different fields. Um, so what I'll be doing is really simple and it's definitely not new in any sense. Um, uh, I'll give you a few examples of efforts to, to understand the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, I will, I'd like to mention that you need good data sets to, if, if you want anything, it, in, in atmospheric research to be successful, you have to start with uh, good measurements. And good measurements are very hard to make, actually. I've, I've done a few of, I've made a few of bad measurements and, and I know that how important good ones are, are, are for the successful completion of, of research. Then you need to apply and interpret correctly the governing equations. And this is my, the main thrust here, that you need to be, all along you need to be uh, grounded on the governing equations. They, they need to, to be the, the basis on which uh, uh, research is done. And I'll give you a few examples, four actually or five, from my personal experience. And I want to be very careful here because um, first of all, there are many, many examples in the literature of successful exploitations of the governing equation. I'm not claiming that this is anything new or novel or anything like that. Quite on the contrary, I'm, I'm claiming here that uh, the, the orthodox way of doing stuff, which is look at equations and, uh, and then do a good measurement and then interpret the results in light of the equations is is very, very fruitful. And there are many, many fruits still to, to bear, uh, to catch from, uh, from this uh, approach. Uh, and before I continue, uh, again, there's not, nothing particularly great in, in, in the examples that I'll be giving, except for, for the one uh, that I'm drawing from uh, Brutzers, my advisors uh, at, at Cornell Research. Um, there's nothing fantastic or anything. There are just you know, some examples that I think are, are, are worth mentioning. But, but I do hope that you enjoy them and you get something uh, useful from them. Okay, the atmosphere is, atmospheric boundary layer turbulence is, is important for two things. First of all, it is a great lab for turbulent flows because then you can achieve really high Reynolds numbers which you can't, in fact, either in the computer uh, or in a wind tunnel or, or anything like that. So, and many, many of our theories, of course, are theories for uh, asymptotically large infinity, perhaps Reynolds numbers. So, uh, so by measuring the atmosphere, we're actually measuring turbulence in a condition that approaches many of the ideas that we, we study in the textbooks and, 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 and learn uh, in the literature. And then again, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, there's a lot of applications going around for our measurements and our theories about the atmospheric boundary layer. And that is a very good uh, uh, reason to work in the field because you can help weather prediction, uh, I, I, this is misspelled here, I, I missed a T, I'm sorry. Um, you can improve your, your climate simulations, which are so important. We're seeing this all the time these days. Uh, you, you can improve your crop productivity, you can improve your hydrological uh, forecasts, you can improve your air pollution studies, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's really a, a field that doesn't need a lot of justification, the, the justification is all around, I think. And it, it, of course, it, it makes us very happy to, to be working in the field because we feel that we can make a difference and we can make uh, 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 worthy contributions. Now, um, this is a challenging field, but look at what Molina and Yaglom, two Russian scientists wrote in their Bible. 
This is uh, from uh, statistical fluid mechanics, which is still today probably the turbulence Bible, right? Um, and when you read uh, uh, the first pages of, of the book, what they wrote, they say, well, really the, the atmosphere is a giant lab. Von Karman uh, mentioned that. Uh, the Reynolds numbers are large. Uh, you can measure in the atmosphere and, and check your theories, as I mentioned. Uh, and then they go on and say some things which are really curious. They say the geometrical conditions of atmospheric turbulence, uh, two-dimensional flow, uh, a rigid wall at the bottom, uh, a plain wall, homogeneous surface. These are simpler conditions than in most labs and laboratory experiments. And the only complication that you have to, to include is that there is thermal stratification. Okay, now, this is the most optimistic statement about um, atmospheric turbulence that I have ever read uh, in my life. And uh, if I can disagree with these the great names uh, at all, it is only here in, in their uh, optimism about how simple to them the atmosphere looked because it isn't simple at all. And I'm, I'm sure that you will agree with me because you know, now we know that there are under stable conditions, there are situations where there's very little, maybe none turbulence in the atmosphere. So it's the full laminar at night under some conditions. Uh, horizontal inhomogeneity is the norm, not the exception. So you see land cover changes, just take a plane and look below, right? Um, there are topographical effects. Uh, we don't really know everything that we should about how inhomogeneous the turbulence is in the vertical. Uh, so what is the role of these complicating terms, uh, like mainly the transport vertical terms in the second order equations and, and how do they disturb our theories? Uh, the, the, the ABL is non-stationary and um, it's difficult to take averages. The error in the averages are huge as I will be able to show you in an example. And we find that more and more scalars are becoming important to our um, uh, understanding of the atmosphere and, and, and to our environmental concerns. So uh, unlike in 1970 or 71, when, when Moni and Iago wrote their stuff, we are, uh, being, we're being uh, asked to to measure more and more chemical species: CO two, methane, N two O, ozone, VOCs, and these species get harder and harder to measure because their concentrations are smaller and smaller. Um, so there you go, lots of complications. Uh, moreover, if if you want to 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 measure LE, the latent heat flux and do something useful in hydrology, you are interested in partitioning it into transpiration and, and evaporation. If you want to, to find out what is respiration and what is photosynthesis in the, in the total NEE that you're measuring with, a, with, a, with, a, with that equivariance, you also need to partition. So there are many, many new questions. So uh, there's plenty of, of work to be done yet and, and plenty of challenges ahead. Uh, let's take a brief look at uh, how, you know, some very fundamental things evolved in, in turbulence. I'd like to start, and I like to, not I would, I, I like to start with the Reynolds in 1895, because this is the guy, he's, he was an engineer, as I am, as uh, uh, Livia, the next uh, presenter, also is. Reynolds is an engineer uh, who... For, for the first time, applies some of earlier uh, Max, James Clerk Maxwell's ideas to a continuum. So Maxwell had uh, written his, uh, his paper on, on, on the kinetic uh, theory of gases and statistical mechanics, uh, probably the foundation of statistical mechanics in 1867. And Reynolds is the first to say, okay, I may be able to do something like this for a continuum. And he derives the turbulence kinetic energy equation. And he does that 
uh, 10 years before Einstein's paper on Brownian motion. So uh, that's a landmark. Um, Richardson uh, uh, is a well-known, very colorful, very interesting person. Um, continues this idea of working with the, the equations, the, the second order equations, uh, derives for the first time a criterion for uh, the maintenance of turbulence under stable conditions, which is the Richardson number. And then in 1941, there's you know, the best thing we've got so far, still, which is uh, the Commodore of 1941 theory for the spectrum, the, the, for the first time, the understanding of really what the dissipation scales are. And uh, in the same year, the four fifths law, which if it worked correctly and if we could measure everything well, would give us a very nice way to, to measure the dissipation rates, for instance, in the atmosphere. Um, now, then in, in, in 46 comes uh, the celebrated Monia Bukov similarity theory, which we all depend on and use extensively to this day. In, in, at the end of the 40s, early 50s, we, not, we, we, we get theories for the behavior of scalars. So there you go. You need to understand temperature, water vapor, CO2, et cetera. These things start with uh, Obukov uh, uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union and course in the, in the West. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a, a, a copy of Obukov's paper in a language that I can, can read. And, and then there is this wonderful paper at the end of the 50s by Batcher about a new microscale when the parental number uh, is too different from one, which is the bachelor microscale. But I won't be touching on the bachelor microscale today. Um, so what we have now is that, you know, another couple of decades in the People now have verified Komogorov's theory. It's very interesting that when Komogorov uh, puts forth his, his 1941 theory, no one has the measurements to corroborate it. And uh, it's only sometime later that it, this is done. This is one of the earliest um, works. Uh, I, I believe it was uh, in a tidal channel that they measured turbulence to verify Komogorov's theory. Um, and then we say, okay, we can reconcile, so to say, uh, or we can uh, combine uh, Komogorov's theory with um, uh, Maniobukov similarity theory. And, and then by and large, we understand the, the inertial subrange and we, and, and we, we bring in Maniobukov similarity theory. So we're not too bad. Um, now, we don't know everything, and, and, and this is a paper that, that I really like. This is from uh, Marcelo Chamekis' master's. Marcelo is now at UCLA. Um, he was my student during his master's, and we're looking at uh, isotropy for second and third order functions. And when you look at uh, uh, our data, what you see is also these arrows mark what you expect to be um, the second order statistics uh, between different velocity components and third order statistics. And what you find is that for the transversal component V, uh, isotropy in the second order is pretty much confirmed, but not in the third. So you have all this uh, wide range of values when they should be clustering around one as the, the second order moments do. When you look at the, the, the vertical component of, of, of the velocity, not even the, the second order statistics comply. Uh, Livia has done some work about that. You can ask her uh, later. And, um, and then when you estimate the dissipation rate, the estimates from the four fifths law come short uh, 10, 20, maybe 30% from the, of the, second order estimates. You're probably seeing some flickering here. So if you allow me, uh, I will quiet the flickering down and uh, go back to the presentation. Good. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing the flickering, but I was. Um, okay. We have lots of stuff to do. One of them, for instance, is to be able to measure the dissipation rate directly in the atmosphere, which is very, very hard to do because you need to measure 
of tiny gradients, which means you need to measure two velocities very close to each other. And this is horribly difficult. Um, you have to understand, we need to understand the deviations from the four fifth law. They pop up in different places, not only in the atmosphere. There are some more general relationships to explain these, um, these discrepancies that I haven't seen anybody test in the, in the atmosphere. If anybody would like to, to join with me with that effort, I would be delighted. We need to extend the analysis to scalars. Now, let's, let, let's go to the equations and see what they tell us in a few examples. Um, what you want to do is uh, you start with the governing equations, you make approximations, you always need to do that. You, you make good experiments and then you do a nice statistical analysis. And hopefully this is a recipe for a successful research. Um, first example I give you, I, I, I won't really go into the details. I'll just mention that um, Wilfred Brutzer, my advisor at Cornell, he started to dig at the uh, fiscal sublayer uh, and, and to try to understand what it could tell about the transfer equations. We all use transfer equations in our research. Our transfer equations are like this last one here. Uh, the flux of a quantity is proportional to a difference between the surface and uh, some level in the air concentrations. And you want to, to predict the transfer coefficient, which is this whole thing here. Now, Brutzert uh, divided this thing into two. He, he looks at the, the interfacial uh, layer, and then he looks at the inertial layer above, above it. And then he matches the two with a, with a fundamental contribution, which is he uses somebody's earlier theory, Denkvert's surface renewal theory. And he says, okay, this theory tells me that particles come back from the bulk of the fluid, they remain in the surface for a while, they exchange the scalar with the surface and then they go away. For how long do they stay exchanging? Uh, this, this is a scalar, this has a, a probability distribution, and there is a parameter that can be obtained from uh, Komogorov's microscale. So there you go, things are coming together. Uh, and the Komogorov microscale is predicted by the Brutzer theory to depend on the thickness of the interfacial sublayer. And by doing that, he was able for the first time to determine that the scalar roughness is not equal to the momentum roughness. So what you see here is that in the transfer equation, the momentum roughness is different from the scalar, significantly different from the scalar roughness. Let me move on because I'm closing to 20 minutes and I'm still not quite there. Um, second example is my, is my PhD thesis part of it. And I want to know if two scalars are perfectly similar. Uh, for instance, temperature and humidity in my case, but it could be CO2 and temperature, CO2 and humidity. And why do I want to do that? Well, it shows in the data some, somehow, not perfectly, but it shows. And uh, there are many, many models that use the similarity to predict other stuff. For instance, there are models that use it to predict um, how much of LE goes into transpiration, how much of LE goes into evaporation and so on. And what I did was to look at the, the, the budget equation, simplified budget equations, uh, drop the transport terms, um, do some high school algebra actually, this is just a, quad, a, a quadra quadratic equation and derive the fact that the correlation coefficient is equal to one. So I know in, 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 in what is the theoretical setting that requires me to have perfect similarity. Um, and I also know what can disturb it and what can disturb it are the transport terms. So um, if I want to, to make progress, I need to two things. I need to calculate gradient production more accurately, which is difficult because you need to, to, to measure the scalar mean concentration at different heights and the measurements have to be zero, per, uh, ideally zero bias between them. Uh, and I have to, to look at the third moments, which is uh, a big challenge. So example two. The example three uh, that I'll be giving you comes from a, a PhD student of mine, Mateus Bernardes. Um, and and it, it talks about, it is about uh, 
a slightly annoying thing, which is the fact that if you go to the field, if you measure your, your, your turbulence data, if you, if you have a single run or block of 30 minutes of data, what do you do? You align uh, uh, the X axis with the mean wind, right? So your rotated wind, mean ve uh, wind vector is now U bar zero, because the transverse component is now zero. But when you look at the, the Reynolds stress tensor, it still has a Y component. So differently from theory, the vectors are unaligned. They are not aligned. Now, uh, how do you measure friction velocity? How do you calculate friction velocity? Do you calculate it uh, with the left or with the right equation? I will bet you that most of the works in the literature, oh, it's not hard to bet. To, to bet because it, you just read many of them, uh, they do it this way. So they use both co covariances to calculate new star, right? You're probably remembering something that you've read or that you've done yourself. Now I claim that this is the correct way. And why do I do that? Because if you plot your friction uh, uh, velocity, U prime, w, excuse me, if you plot the, the UW covariance with the error bars against um, stability, you get a, a picture like that. If you plot the VW covariance against stability, you get a picture like that on the right. And what you're seeing is the error bars. So really you're not measuring U prime V prime bar at all. If you look at the statistical significance of this, you're measuring zero, right? And also what you see in here is that as you approach minus zeta is equal to minus one, even U prime W prime bar goes to zero, which is something that we have known uh, from very long because it's the local free convection theory by Wingard et al, which says that in, in, in local free convections, U star is no longer uh, a relevant turbulent scale. So, if we put those things together, uh, and you remember the governing equations and the, and the sound theory behind it, you can interpret your measurements better. Here's the point here. I'm almost there. How much time, Andrea? Uh, I think we are at the end, but maybe you can- Okay, one, minute, one more minute. Last yes. example. Uh, this is uh, from a work by uh, Marcelo, Olivia, and I. We are looking at the TKE, the turbulence kinetic energy, and you, we are writing this uh, in a different guise. We're writing this, putting the production term in the, in the x-axis and the buoyancy production in the y-axis. And uh, we're dumping everything that we don't know as the, the residue. And under perfect conditions, that is, if production uh, E plus buoyancy minus dissipation equals to zero, you would fall on this straight line here. Now, if you look at the measurements in the inertial layer uh, for, for good validity of um, oneo bukov similarity theory, what you get is these uh, blue and, and magenta experimental results. If you look at uh, field data in an inertial sublayer, sub this is a hat, you kind of confirm that. But if you go to the uh, roughness of layer, then no, it is uh, totally different uh, from that. Um, now, uh, we don't understand what this is, but this is diagnosing us in a different way, um, a non a, a not a non canonical uh, boundary layer, which is the roughness of layer over a forest. This, these things were measured over the Amazon forest. So I'll conclude briefly. I'm sorry I'm uh, over time. Um, we need to understand uh, uh, the discarded terms, the transport terms, the advection terms, et cetera, et cetera. We need to make progress towards understanding that. And one way to do it is to start with the ideal conditions, as I just mentioned in the last example, and perturbing them. Uh, of course, we always need better measurements, better models, better theories and so on and so forth. So to make progress, we need universality. Universality comes 
inevitably from the governing equations and good theories. Um, so let us let the governing equations and good theories guide us towards new discoveries. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I guess that's it. Thank you, Nelson. I will okay. pass on to Livia. I will just give a, a brief introduction. Livia Freire is a researcher at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, where she has been working on improving the understanding and modeling tools of atmospheric turbulence and boundary layer meteorology. Her interests range from theoretical and numerical studies of turbulence to field data measurement and analysis with emphasis in, sorry, uh, with emphasis in canopy flows and particle transport. Examples of recent studies include the investigation of flow properties, such as the critical flux Richardson number and the impact of topography on turbulence in the Amazon rainforest, using observational data and the development of a new wall model for large eddy simulation of the atmospheric boundary relate to improve near wall turbulent transport estimates. Thank you, Andre. Sorry if I interrupted you here. I'll no. share my screen again. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes. See my screen? Perfect. Is that good? Yes. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. And uh, I really appreciate being here. This is really nice. And in this uh, second part of the talk, which I hope it's also connected to Nelson's part, which is a big motivation for my work too. And now I wanna mention a little bit about uh, how we combine high frequency measurements and numerical simulation in order to help us uh, in addition to the governing equations and helping us interpret this complicated problem of um, turbulence in the atmosphere. And as Nelson already introduced, well, we do a lot of research in that topic because uh, we are really interested in, in studying the basic physics of turbulent flows and help us understand that we use the atmosphere also. But we also need to be able to provide simplified models about the behavior of the atmospheric boundary layer uh, to help in the fields of climate change and weather prediction and air quality, ecology, and, and so on. And some of the tools that we use in this investigation is a combination of computational simulation and field and lab data. So in particular, I will mention uh, one specific type of computational simulation that we use and, and field data that uh, we need for that. So starting with computational simulation, uh, the, we, we use that the good part of using computational simulation is that we write these codes from the governing equations. So in the best case scenario, we would hope to be able to get exact solutions for our um, uh, fluid problem, right? Uh, exact, of course, here is in quotes because uh, if we're doing a numerical simulation, we are already approximating numerically, right? So the derivatives are already an approximation, but we, are, we hope that in the best case scenario, we could get something that it's really close to the exact solutions for that fluid dynamics problem. Uh, and the advantage of performing computational simulation overall is that we have control of the situation, right? So we control the conditions uh, of our flow, what we want to simulate, we can isolate some uh, specific effects and that help us a lot in uh, interpreting the results, especially for turbulence, which is such a complex and, and chaotic uh, property, right? Uh, but the disadvantage of those computational simulations typically is because they're, it's the fact that they're very simplified conditions. So for example, sometimes we assume that our flow is homogeneous in the horizontal directions in the particular case of the atmosphere, or that we have flat surfaces and things like that. And of course, this is very simplified compared to all the complexities that we have uh, in reality. Uh, but again, uh, it's a useful approach. So if you want to go to that best case scenario, uh, in fluid dynamics in general, when we just solve the Navier-Stokes equation and the scalar transport equations for all the variables we are interested, and we solve them without any approximation, we call that direct numerical simulations or DNS. And if we were to perform DNS of the atmosphere, of the atmospheric boundary layer, 
we would need a domain in the order of one kilometer with a grid size in the order of one millimeter. So this has a computational cost that is too high. We cannot perform this uh, these days, but we need that scales in order to be able to represent all the eddies, the large eddies of the, the atmospheric boundary layer in the order of one kilometer, but also the smallest eddies, which can be as small as one millimeter um, in the order of that. So the second best approach, since the computational cost in that case would be too high, is to increase the grid size to something in the order of one meter. And when we do that, we are now performing what we call large edge simulation or LES. And this is a tool that it's been, it's been used for the atmospheric boundary layer a lot in the, the past decades. So in this case, now we can still resolve the large edges, but we cannot resolve anymore the smallest edges. And what that look like? So if we have our velocity variable, or it could be any of the variables of the simulation, temperature or the concentration of a gas, uh, and that the original uh, result was this black line here with a lot of fluctuations, right? The result that LES will give us corresponds to this blue line here, which is like a filtered version of our field that only has the large scale fluctuations. And the difference between them, of course, is this small scale fluctuations here in red. So we perform this decomposition of our variables between the large scale and the small scale fluctuations. And if we go to the Navier-Stokes equation and include this uh, decomposition, we end up with an equation, a governing equation for the LES, which is very similar to the governing equation uh, for DNS. But now it has this additional term here, which represents all the effects of the small scales that are not resolved into our resolved uh, flow field. So this is an approximation, of course. We need to, we need to close this, this equation in order to perform the simulation. We need to write, to perform a model of this term here, which is something that already brings approximation to our results. So now our result is not perfect uh, anymore. But the reason that we use LES a lot for the atmospheric uh, study is because the large scales, they concentrate most of the kinetic energy of the flow. So if we look at the turbulent kinetic energy as a function of scales, like so the scales, the subgrid, the ones that are not resolving directly and the resolved scales of the LES, most of the kinetic energy is in the resolved scales. So when we're interested, for example, in turbulent transport of scalars, of gases, uh, this is something that, that means that LES would do a good job in studying those things. Whereas the small scales, they concentrate, for example, the dissipation rate, which is something that needs to be uh, included in the modeling of this term here. But uh, overall, what we do is we solve in LES in a three-dimensional domain, the filtered Navier-Stokes equation and the filtered equation for the transport of all the variables of interest. Uh, and we can have different types of parameterizations for the subgrid scale part, which is what we call the subgrid model of the LES. And we have different options for that. Uh, of course, we can use different numerical methods, mesh organization, boundary initial conditions. And because of that, the, the, there is a lot of research still being done in the development of new LES codes uh, and the testing and changing the current codes and also, of course, in using these codes for, for applications. So this is an example that I want to share with you of a study that uh, we did using LES. So in this study, we were interested in uh, finding out the mean concentration of small settling particles as a function of particle size and atmospheric stability. So we wanted to isolate these two effects. And to do that, we simplified the problem a lot. So we assume that we have horizontally homogeneous conditions and flat and no other thing happening at the surface. Uh, and we wanted to, to end up with an equation for the concentration of the settling particles as a function of height, which is in the lines of those uh, log law models that we have for the mean velocity, for example, or the concentration of any scalar, which has the, the Monibukov similarity theory uh, correction for those profiles, right? So to do that, uh, we started from the governing equation for the mean concentration of this particle. So in this equation, I already eliminated the horizontal derivatives because we are assuming uh, homogeneous conditions. And we have this term here that has a, a settling velocity, a constant settling velocity, which incorporates the effect of the particle size. 
So this settling velocity behaves as an advecting term for the, the mean concentration. And in order to, to solve this equation and get a, a result for the mean concentration that we want, we need to um, parameterize the, the turbulent flux of this concentration, which we use the classical approach of the flux profile relationship using the Monyubkov correction, right? The, the added diffusivity uh, approach. So we, we use this there and we solve this equation and we end up with the simplified equation here, which should represent the effect, the, the mean concentrations of function of height, take into account the size of the particle and the atmospheric uh, stability. And to check if this uh, solution was a good one, we performed LES because in LES we can simplify and we can uh, check those effects separately. So we did LES for different atmospheric stability and different particle sizes. So for example, this is a snapshot for the neutral condition and this is for the unstable. You can see that they ge generate very different plumes of particle concentration. And we were able to see that this equation behave, uh, represents well the, the behavior at the surface layer, right? The lowest 10% of the atmospheric boundary layer, which is where those uh, equations uh, usually are, are valid. So this is just an example. And overall we use LES, right? Which is an approximate equation with simplified conditions. And we need validation of those simulations from field measurements. So this is one place in which field measurements are, are needed um, in our study, uh, which brings me to more details to it. So when we're talking about uh, field measurements, uh, we are usually talking about high frequency time series from point measurements, right? So if we're interested in turbulence, we, we perform those uh, high frequency time series, which we put a sensor that measures at a point of the atmosphere. Sometimes we construct arrays of those measurements, such as in the HATS uh, experiments, uh, so we can have a better picture of the flow field. And the advantage of those measurements is that they represent the reality, right? So they measure what we actually have. Again, the reality in quotes, of course, because uh, the sensors can have errors, so it's not really the reality, but the closest that we can get. And the problem with field measurement is that uh, we're now talking about an uncontrolled flow field. So we cannot control the weather, so we measure what we, we have at the time, which can include a combination of many different effects, which sometimes is difficult to interpret what's actually happening, right? So when we are performing those measurements in order to get uh, different uh, conditions, we usually perform those, those measurements for many days. And again, if you want to measure all the scales of this turbulent flow down to the smallest eddies, we need to perform these measurements in a very high frequency. So for example, something in the order of 2000 Hertz. So 2000 measurements per second. And if you do that for many days, you can imagine that generates a lot of data. So it's very heavy and perhaps uh, difficult to handle. And the, the other problem is that uh, to measure in this high frequency, you need very sensitive sensors. So the ones uh, that I know is what we call hot wire or hot film sensors. This is a picture of it compared to a sonic anemometer. So I believe that most of you know sonic anemometers which measure the trivial velocity components in high frequency, we usually use them. But uh, if this, this hot film sensors, they're much smaller. And you can see here the tip of it. This is a closer look at the tip of the hot film. And they, they have this very thin uh, wires. They're very sensitive. And that's the reason they can measure turbulence at this high frequency. But that also means that they're very uh, sensitive in a sense that it's difficult to use, they can break easily. And they also need very frequent calibration because they're sensitive to the air temperature and the humidity, or also if there is dust in the sensor. So it's very, it's not common to use those sensors in the atmosphere, it's very difficult. There, there are a few studies who, who use them, but um, it's not common. What is mostly used is are the sonic anemometers this bigger one here, which now has a measurement frequency in the order of 20 Hertz. So I, I have seen as high as 60 Hertz, I guess. But if we're doing measurement in, in the order of 20 Hertz, again, we are not able to measure the smallest uh, eddies. So the smallest scale fluctuations of this flow are not being measured. So in a sense, it's some kind of large scale, um, large eddy measurement of the atmosphere. 
But we use them because they're very robust, so they can stay in the field for long periods of time. They don't need uh, frequent calibrations and they can stand like different weather conditions and, and things like that. So when we compare the data between hot fume and sonic, for example, this is an example of the one dimensional energy spectrum as a function of wave number. And you can see that the hot wire would measure the, could measure the full spectrum, but the sonic anemometer will have uh, end at, at a given frequency. And this is something that introduced errors to our measurement. So we need to be aware of those errors and we need to, to handle them when we're interpreting this data, right? So overall for field measurements, there is a lot of work uh, that we need to do for data selection. Uh, for example, if we can find the stationarity period, the homogeneity conditions and things like that, we spend a lot of time and energy into data selection. Of course, also statistical treatment, what is the proper statistical treatment to get what we need, to get what we need. Uh, we need to be aware of the type of errors that the sensors that we are using uh, can generate. And for that reason, also, there is a lot of research on sensor development and improvement of the current sensors, improvement of statistical analysis, and of course, application of those um, data into the investigating problems that we are interested in. So again, to close the cycle, we sometimes can use simulation to help to interpret this data, which has all these complications. And that's the second example that I want to mention. Um, is that so? This is a study that we performed uh, on the effect of topography in the Amazon rainforest. So, this is a, a map of the topography in the region of the Amazon. So the topography in the Amazon is very gentle, and for that reason, most of the time we assume that it's that we have approximately flat conditions. But uh, you can see here in these two uh, regions here where we have those squares, they correspond to the places where we have measurements from towers. So these are the Ato experiments and the Go Amazon experiment. And you can see here the topography around the tower. This is, uh, note that it is not at scale. So this is kilometers and this is like tens of meters. But you can see that the topography is not flat, of course, it, it has some, some perturbations. So in this study, we looked at the reduced turbulent kinetic energy budget. So we write the, the shear production, then the buoyancy production minus the, the dissipation rate, and everything else we represent as the residual of this, this budget. So this can include all the transport terms, advection, and storage, and things like that. Um, and this is the plot of a LES that we performed of this problem. So in this LES, uh, we simulated this gentle topography here, this uh, idealized topography, and we included the vegetation, the effect of the vegetation of the Amazon. So this white region here corresponds to the Amazon canopy in the simulation. And above that, uh, we looked at the residual term uh, as a function of the location relative to the topography. So here the, the positive is red and the, and the blue is negative uh, residual. And the reason that we performed that is because when we look at the data from the Atu and Go Amazon as a function of this residual, as a function of height, you have all this spread of the data, of course, from all the different conditions, but also you, we have this negative, uh, this values that are concentrated in the negative side here, for example, right? And when we assume that the topography is flat, so we can get this result from an LES of a flat uh, simulation, the result for the residual as a function of height is those black dots here. So it's positive close to the canopy top and it decreases, but it stays positive, you see? Now, if we perform the same simulation now, uh, take into account this gentle topography, you have all this variation of the, the residual value depending on where you are relative to the topography, including at top of the ridge, uh, these values that become negative and remain negative. So this is the result that we get from LES, and this looks similar to what we get from the data. So this is how we combine these two things to try to see uh, perhaps the cause of all this spread 
it can be explained. It's something within this residual of the turbulent kinetic energy, and we can narrow our investigation on, on how uh, uh, those things actually behave and how we can select the data better and, and, and things like that. So this is just to give you an example. And to summarize, uh, of course, you probably already knew that, but uh, numerical tools and field data complement each other. And sometimes we really can work on them together to, to look at the problem. And there is a lot of research opportunities today into better uh, numerical development and testing of the current models for different conditions and applications. And also for, for field data, we have a lot of um, research opportunities in sensor development, uh, study of the errors of those sensors, the best, better statistical approaches when interpreting uh, turbulence data and applications. So this uh, was it. Thank you for your attention and for having me. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Livia. So I think uh, as we always do in our seminar, maybe uh, uh, everyone that wants uh, to, to ask something can open your camera or your microphone and ask uh, directly to our panelists for, from today. I, I have a quick question to, to get things started, if that's okay. Uh, I, I don't see any other raised grant, hands raised. So um, I guess this, uh, thank you both for, for the presentation. It's really, really interesting. I guess this one is more directed at Nelson, but uh, Livia, if you, if you have a, um, an answer as well, please uh, jump in. Nelson, you presented some of the uh, this you, you you call them discarded terms, right? Uh, and um, I was wondering if you were to suggest one of those terms for for a new PhD student, for instance, to pick as a topic to develop their research. What would you suggest they they pick? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Uh, I think it depends very much on the on the particular experimental setting that you are studying. Uh, you just saw at the end of Livia's talk, uh, an example where topography is very important. If I remember, well, I, I'm, I'm co-author of that paper. There are actual effects that are important in that case. I will tell you what my current interest is. And I'm currently very, very much interested in the vertical transport term for a scale because in my opinion, this is what disrupts scalar similarity to a huge degree. And I'll just mention to you that uh, we're just looking, it, it hasn't been published yet, uh, only in conferences, but we're just looking at uh, the CO2 scalar budget over a lake. You know, lake is a, the, the perfect scenario for Molina Bukov similarity theory. And yet, when you look at uh, some similarity functions and some correlation, coefficients with other scalars, they are really, really bad. So it must be coming from you know, the transport terms. So it's, it's really a personal uh, preference right now. Uh, I would love just to look at the, uh, the transport terms for a scalar. That's not very interesting, thank you. Um, if, if I can abuse my time a little bit here, if, if you if you were to pick a, a theme, I guess the uh, very interesting results from uh, the topography and uh, all the Amazon that gets even more complex for sure. But if you if you had to pick a theme to suggest to a PhD student, what would you your pick be? Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm uh, with that Amazon project in mind, and it's something that we are interested. in. And I think the horizontal advection term was the 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 term that was more important in that case. Uh, so we're probably interested in, in going on in that direction. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? 
can just open your camera or just open your microphone and ask directly. I have some message in the chat, but the uh, particular uh, private ones, and they are asking if uh, if you would be able to 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 send the, the presentations to to put in the in the blog for the for people Definitely. to download. I will. I'll send the PDF. I, I think I already did, but I'll I'll send you the latest version, Andre. And if you can share. Yeah, okay. Sure. I'll send it to you. Yeah, maybe yeah. I'll add the, the references better in the, at the end, in case anyone is interested. Then we we'll, we we'll put in a FlexNet blog, so uh, with a link for download, then everyone can can download mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps one of uh, you two, Andre or Gilberto, can uh, say quickly what is the overall. Um, uh, not goal, but um, focus of those those talks here and the, from the public of this this conference series. Think you can get it, Gilberto? Sure. Uh, so the the theme is 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 very uh, um, open, but it's mostly uh, the Flux community, right? So it's uh, FluxNet, Ameriflux, uh, and anyone working with. Uh, fluxes. So uh, I I think this this is the main community that uh, joins for these for these talks. Um, I don't know if that clarifies exactly your your question, but uh, if you if you have a specific point that you'd like for for me to expand on, please let me know. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm really excited to to get to know you guys better, and I was just curious if. Um, this is more like the public who works with um, the development of those flux measurements and really like dip into the, into the, you know, the details, for example, of sensors and things like that, or more on the user side where you have a community that has people doing modeling and or just applications in, in more specific areas. I imagine that it's a broad group, right? It seems. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think there are people working across the spectrum from uh, the, the underlying theories to specifics of instrumentation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that's definitely the case here. I think we have a couple of uh, questions in the chat. And yes. do you want to? to um, yes, the, the question are arriving here. So first, uh, what are the main differences between scalar and momentum transport? And um, the, I think it's for both. Maybe. Yeah. If I can get it, there's also a, a message from Dave Fitzgerald. He, he kindly sent a reference. Um, uh, yes, David, uh, 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 the Coriolis term uh, changes the, the, the picture in the atmospheric boundary layer. I don't think it invalidates what I just mentioned because uh, the data that I showed was measured very, very close to the surface. Uh, but but by all means, yes, this is a nice reference. I didn't know about it. I just downloaded it and I'm looking at it. And there are some comments about the importance of the height at which the terms are evaluated. And the, the differences between scalar and momentum transport, pressure. And, um, and pressure is a very, very, I mean, I've been, th I'm, I'm teaching a course uh, and I've, I've been thinking about it a, a little bit. Pressure is a horrible thing because we can't measure it as well as we can measure the other turbulence quantities, right? Because to measure pressure, hi Dave, we have to stagnate the flow and then we destroy turbulence. Um, so this is a big problem, you know, and I think it is the, the complicating factor together with the Coriolis, of course, a term um, for uh, the momentum transport. And I think we have one more for our, uh from Livia uh, hot film. Uh, what, was the hot film able to measure the dissipation? From the spectra shown by Livia, it did not seem to show an increase in energy at the smaller scales. 
Uh, hi, Sean, thanks for the question. Actually, that spectra I showed is just a synthetic spectra just to, to help visualize the differences between the, between the two sensors. So it's not a real measurement. I'm working currently with uh, real measurements from the CHATS experiment, but since uh, I didn't have time to, to, to uh, discuss that with the, the other co-authors, I didn't want to include a, a real figure in that. But for some cases, and for the CHATS experiment in particular, it's really difficult to select good data from the hot film. Um, but from some cases, we were able to, to measure um, the dissipation scales at those 200, uh, 2000 uh, hertz frequency. Does that answer your question? Thank you. And Nelson, I think we have, you have more from David. Uh, can you get it in, on the chat? Well, I think it's more of a general comment. I agree. Uh, and I think it, it, it meets some of, of my closing remarks that uh, yes, uh, sometimes we, we just stick to, to uh, models, mental models that are too simple. And then uh, the challenge now is to, to be able to explain more complicated things like the topography stuff that, that Livia was, was talking about. I, 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 I could not agree more. I, I think it's more a comment that Dave is, is making. I could not agree more. Can I ask a question? Yes, please, Thomas. Hi. First of all, nice seeing everybody again. I know like five or six people from this chat that I haven't seen in years. Uh, OK, so both the questions to both of you, really. And one way or another, both of you talked about taking into consideration terms that have traditionally, traditionally been neglected, what you call like a disturbance, right? And that is, in my opinion, definitely like the, a very good step right it's definitely do a step in the right direction uh, but uh it's hard to i'm assuming it's hard to figure out uh, which term is doing the most disturbing i guess so which makes it makes it in my head kind of hard to make predictions based on on that on those general umbrella of disturbances right so i guess my question is what is the next step of you know making our theories more broad. I've been trying to imagine that over the last few minutes and I can't. So I figured I'd just ask. Lisa, you go first now. <laughs> Come on, that's a difficult question. <laughs> no, that's why I'm saying this. Sorry about a difficult question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know, actually. I think I... Um, my approach has been... I, I think I like the idea of using... Uh, the, the simulations and the synthetic data, just um, uh, exactly in that sense of doing one one step at a time and evaluating how much it brings to the to the uh, to the problem, right? How much it contributes, especially with the our goal in mind. Because sometimes, uh, for example, one of the things I've been exploring more recently is the the error in the dissipation rate estimations from the data. And even though we find these errors, it's, they seem significant. Sometimes compared to what we actually need for, to, from that dissipation, it's, it's not gonna bring a big impact, you know what I mean? So I, I really like those tools of having the, the simulations and the synthetic data in the sense of like taking into account the errors, just like Nelson taught us <laughs> and, and evaluating how it impacts in the end, because we, we don't know for different problems, there are different things that, that can be significant, right? So that example of the topography combined with canopy in the Amazon was kind of a surprise, I guess, for us and, and end up being relevant. Okay, uh, uh, I agree with Livia, I, I think that Numerical modeling has to play an important role. Actually, we're together starting a project, uh, hoping to, to use some kind of old fashioned RANS uh, modeling, which is uh, simpler, but cheaper than large eddy simulation. And hoping that you know, with, with, with that approach, we can perhaps also identify some of the things. The other thing is that in some cases, 
it may be reasonable to to guess which term is 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 the is the culprit. Like we have this. Actually, you have two lakes. We have measured CO two fluxes over the two of them, and the variance similarity functions are just horrible. They for CO two, not for water vapor, but for CO two, they're horrible. And uh, I would guess that it is not advection, horizontal advection, because the lake, you know, the lake surface is so uniform. So it must be something else, and, and that something else probably is the vertical transport term. Uh, so sometimes perhaps you can from the you know the experimental setup and the and the topography and the land cover, et cetera, et cetera, guess uh, which terms are more important. But I think that we will need more and more uh, support from uh, the, the result of numerical simulations, even with their shortcomings, which always exist, to guess better. Rather than just say, Oh, no, 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 let me close my eyes and believe uh, this is the Ukrainian step and the monia bukov similarity theory is perfect because, you know, it is a flat, really flat land. Right, David? <laughs> Water isn't flat if the wind blows. <laughs> You're right. All right, thanks for answering the question. I agree with that. And thanks, and sorry for the hard question. Again. So we're just passing time. So I just want to say thank you very much to Professor Nelson and uh, Professor Olivia and for all the participants and the panelists. And also thank you very much for um, Gilberto and Christine but the, that is not here today, but they all uh, uh, set up the, the Zoom, the logistics, and, and everything happens perfectly. And we want to say thanks to the other members of the FluxNet ECN committee members. And I think, um, Gabriela, do you want to do the, the last announcement? Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, many of you probably saw that Teresa had shared some of our last minute announcements in the chat. If you want to quickly copy and paste that uh, for reference, we have our web page. You can check us out there. Uh, you can join our email listserv where we make announcements of any upcoming webinars. We have folks that like to post postdoc or PhD or master's opportunities, um, job opportunities get posted there pretty frequently. Uh, and we do have social media pages, so you can join us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and then Teresa is going to check in on AGU's ability to host pods this year. So uh, if possible, we'll be organizing a place for those of you attending AGU to, to gather. Thank you again to our speakers for joining us today. It was a really wonderful conversation. Very great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us.